Uh, welcome. So first, um, I would like to thank our uh, guest here for accepting our um, invitation. So although he has like, uh, you know, he's very busy and his time is very precious, so he actually um, accepted to share with us some of his experience and expertise in high performance computing um, and astrophysics. So our guest is uh, Falk Herwig. He's an associate professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy here at UVEC. He obtained his PhD from Astrophysics Institute, um, Potsdam, uh, and held postdoc positions in Potsdam, UVEC, and Los Alamos. Before joining UVEC in 2008, he held a lecture faculty position at Keeley University in England. Um, as you already know, he's an outstanding astrophysicist. As such, he was awarded uh, uh, the Ludwig uh, Berman uh, Award in 2004. Um, his research is about astrophysical simulations of the origin of the elements in stars and stellar explos explosions. He has worked extensively on the evolution of stars in particular white dwarfs, binary stars, and their interactions, as well as the nucleus synthesis in all of these stars. Um, Folk is known for his large-scale simulations, um, you know, thousands of cores, um, and he uses powerful computational tools to simulate the hydrodynamical mixing process inside the stars and to analyze the nuclear synthetic signatures of different types of stars. He's an active member of MESA platform, and he's the main founder of uh, New Grid Collaboration. Um, I will leave the, the floor to Falk to enlighten us today. Well, thank you for this very kind introduction. Um, before I get started, I would like to have a quick idea of uh, what the audience is. And I wasn't really entirely sure what it would be. But uh, is the assumption correct uh, that we're looking at an 80% computing-oriented uh, audience and maybe 20% science-oriented? Is that a right assessment? I guess that's right. Okay. So um, if, if that's sort of, uh, I'm working under that assumption and uh, uh, simplify some of the uh, uh, details of the uh, scientific uh, implications, um, uh, not by making them wrong or anything, but maybe by not uh, going into too much detail on some. But I have some slides uh, prepared that I, that I hope can really uh, explain what this is all about. So um, in, in, the, in the group that we have here in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Victoria, we're, we're uh, following various directions of um, computational astrophysics in, in stellar topics star, uh, concerning stars. And uh, uh, one that project, uh, so there's three projects that I'm just listing here. I only want to talk about one in more detail, but um, one of the projects that uh, has uh, just been finished was a PhD project uh, working on binary merger simulations uh, where a giant star is merging uh, or engulfing a low mass or planet companion. And um, these were runs mostly done on Nestor here at UVic. Uh, we used for that the uh, ENZO uh, code, which is a publicly available code that originates in the U.S. in Mike Norman's group um, and is used for cosmological simulations. And what we have done is adapted for star simulations, which required uh, adopting the Poisson solver uh, and things like that. Typical runs for that project were uh, on 200 cores for maybe two weeks. Um, uh, for one run, and you can see here one example where um, we have the companion spiraling, spiraling into the giant star, uh, and this is the density representation of a polar and a edge on view, and um, well, the uh, orbital energy is transferred into the binding energy. Uh, this was a suite of uh, simulations that was more extensive and more detailed than what had been done before, and it uh, provided some very interesting insight and, of course, opened up uh, many new questions that we now have to work on. Like always, you know, you try to solve something and then you realize there's all these other new questions. That project is finished, and I um, just want to show you here, for now at least, uh, the student uh, has a postdoc position now in Germany, 
Uh, we'll continue on this, uh, but Nestor was critical for that work, uh, and we worked very well on that cluster. Uh, the other two projects uh, are, so we use the RESCRED resources also for uh, comprehensive nucleosynthesis simulations, and these are simulations where we take um, uh, maybe a one-dimensional stellar evolution complete from the main sequence to the supernova explosion or uh, the white dwarf, uh, including 1D spherically symmetric uh, models of the explosion at the end. Uh, and these have multiple zones, of course, maybe 1,000, 2,000 zones, and then we follow these on uh, each of the zones and calculate the complete possible nucleosynthesis that could go on there, including uh, all the S process, the heavy element production. So these are thousands of literary, I mean, all the species that you see in the chart of isotopes. Um, uh, we do this in the post-processing mode. It's parallel. Um, this is a this is a code that we developed in our group over the last couple of years, and uh, I think it's it's quite competitive internationally uh, in, in this area. Um, I'm not aware of people doing it uh, at that scale like we do. And just to give you an idea, one of these cases, say you want to have a 20 solar mass all the way through the supernova in 1D, of course. Uh, costs about um, uh, two days on 150 cores. And uh, if you want to have a full set that is meaningful and that people can use, you need to have about 50 of those. And, and that's sort of a typical project size where you say, do these, and then you change the physics assumption, do another one. Okay, so you get an idea of what the problem size is. And uh, there's a student uh, in my group working on that right now, and we have also several external people logging in using the setup uh, to uh, Westgate computers, former postdoc uh, and his student now and, and another student from my previous position in England. So this is, uh, this is going on. Also uh, a lot done here on, on Lattice uh, in the past uh, and now more on Nestor again. Uh, these run on 150 cores and uh, are sort of production bread and butter kind of activities. Um, then we have, uh, finally, and this is what I really want to talk about, is 3D cell hydrodynamic simulations um, of convection and nuclear burning. And uh, those have been performed on Orcanus, uh, mostly uh, with uh, an important testing phase where we uh, did uh, smaller runs to, to get started, uh, also on Lettuce uh, in uh, early 2000, uh, 2011. And so this is what I really want to talk about. And uh, I, I thought that in order to explain what the physics is uh, briefly, uh, I, I do a couple of sketches um, as they sort of allow you to highlight what the essential idea here is. So we're looking at a star that is uh, very evolved uh, towards its, uh, the end of its life. Uh, it is a star that will end up as a white dwarf, and this white dwarf is preformed here in the center. And the center, uh, also shown here in this wedge, is inactive. It is C, carbon, and oxygen. But it is surrounded by uh, helium burning. And this helium burning uh, is sort of uh, periodically unstable and uh, seeds uh, violent convection uh, in a significant layer here in a shell uh, surrounding uh, this inert core. And I marked this as red. And then uh, these stars have on top uh, hydrogen-rich uh, layers, which may or may not be convective, but that's not important. Uh, what is important is that, uh, uh, so here I, I show you the profile here as a, as a function of radius. What is critical here is that uh, we are interested in the, in the important case where protons um, can, so I'm going to skip so this is sort of the more science uh, version of this slide, but I'm going to skip that and continue with the sort of sketch version. Okay, so here you have your wedges again, and the temperature increases inward. And the key of this problem is that we have protons uh, that, although they are less buoyant, the mean molecular weight is smaller, uh, in this high gravity environment, still when this highly turbulent convective uh, interface here gets in touch with these protons. Uh, they are entrained. They are mixed in. Okay, 
uh, and although this is a small amount, these protons are then uh, going into an environment where the reaction rate with carbon-12 is increasingly uh, fast, uh, and when these protons have come maybe halfway down here, the burning time scale, and therefore the time scale for the nuclear energy release is the same as the dynamic time scale. And then we're looking at a typical combustion problem. Okay, fluid dynamics knows this regime as combustion. This is what happens. It happens in a jet engine or it happens uh, in, uh, in your car where um, there, there are reactions, chemical or nuclear in this case, that release energy at a level where you feed back into the fluid flow. So this is dynamic nuclear burning interacting with the flow. And then, of course, this becomes a very nonlinear problem, right? And there cannot be hope, any hope anymore that we are getting the right answer in global 1D models that average over the entire convective uh, regime in whatever smart way. But we have to really bite the bullet and do the full 3D nonlinear hydro problem if we want to get the right answer, OK? So this is what this is about. And just to say, why is this really important? Because you form nitrogen 13 out of this, which decays, by the way, on the dynamic time scale by coincidence. This, is a, this ends up being important for the astronomers. Uh, and this nitrogen 13 decays to carbon 13 and captures another alpha further down here and releases neutrons. And these are neutrons that are critical for the production of the heavy elements, stuff like barium, uh, rubidium, zirconium, lanthanum, all these trans iron elements, lead, they're produced from these neutrons um, in these kind of environments. Okay, so this is sort of the background. And the important thing to take away here is convective mixing and trains protons, that's the first problem. Um, and then, so how does this entrainment process work? And then convective reactive combustion regime that defies our 1D models. That's the second sort of important piece here that we are worrying about, okay? Now, uh, I will move forward and uh, skip a couple of details here, uh, but you, are, you, know, you can ask me about these. Uh, the key question, so we have studied this regime in 1D for 10 years or more, uh, and really found out why does it not work and why does it not agree with observations. But the key questions that we want to answer through hydro simulations is, what is the feedback of nuclear energy into the hydrodynamic flow? Uh, fluid dynamicists have, a, have names for all of these things that I spare you the details about. Uh, what is the morph and so in order to answer that, we need to know what is the morphology of the entrained fu fuel. For example, is this fuel as it comes in premixed and then just diffuses down, or does it come down as a homogeneous plume, and we are more in a flame regime. Okay, so the morphology of the entrained stuff matters. How is turbulence interacting with the uh, uh, rate of entrainment and the stuff coming down? Uh, and so, and finally, then uh, we need to have a we need to have this entrainment process itself. That's of course a starting point. If we can't get that quantitatively correct, then we have no hope to do whatever. Okay. So these are sort of these two aspects here that we want to uh, look into. And so um, I'm uh, one slide short of showing the, you one the first great movie here. So just hang in here for for the dynamicists uh, and the physicists uh, who care. Uh, these are the equations. We're basically solving the other equations. Um, there are several things that make this really cheap and easy. And the most important thing from the computational point of view is we don't have gravity, that we don't, so we don't have to solve a Poisson solver. So we only have local uh, interactions, which means that the parallelization uh, is really easy and can be done in a very efficient way. Uh, this is why we can scale to thousands of processes with this problem. We have a static gravity in there, a potential. Uh, and this is different compared to the Enzo calculation of the common envelope. The common envelope needs to have self-gravity. You need to uh, do Poisson solver. This is why they don't, don't go up to more than 200 cores. 
right? Scaling really bottoms out uh, above that. So no gravity, no radiation, which would be another candidate for a long uh, distance force, which would really ruin your parallelism. Um, but there are some things that make this very hard and difficult and challenging, and that's the large dynamic range, 10, 11, 12 pressure scale heights, which is really a lot if you have to project that radially, and you have to resolve all these pressure scale heights or density scales or whatever. The flow is still it is vigorous convection, but it is in the deep interior a slow flow. We're talking about Mach numbers of 3%. Okay, and this is a regime where explicit schemes are not really, I mean, explicit schemes are really expensive because you are current limited, current condition limited, uh, the sound speed limits the time steps, but at the same time, implicit uh, uh, methods aren't, I mean, they aren't really cheaper either because you pay so much more to do an implicit solve compared to the explicit solve. So we're right at this edge where you just have to pay what you have to pay. Uh, and you can see what we have to pay. Uh, we need to do millions of time steps on our grid. So if you just see what our grids are and you're not impressed, then please bear in mind that any of these runs are above a million time steps. And the other challenge here is that the entrainment against buoyancy of really small amounts of stuff, we're talking about uh, 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 less than a per mil, we're talking about stuff that is at a level of 10 to the minus 5 in volume fraction or mass fraction or whatever, and doing that is really extremely difficult. You need a very accurate advection scheme for that uh, because we have, a, in these deep interiors, we have a very stiff boundary of this convection zone. It's almost like concrete. It's very stiff. Okay? The relative stability on both sides is very large. Okay, so... Um, Calculation I'm going to show you here first is a um, little bit of a history. What did we do? How did we do it? Uh, in 2011, after having done some scaling tests in 2010 uh, on Nestor, we did many, many tests, uh, many of them on, them on lattice, and we were really basically busy for a year weeding out uh, all sorts of issues concerning, you know, what's the right resolution, compiler issues, uh, th um, code details, batch queuing system issues that some of you may remember that we worked through, um, all sorts of stuff. And finally, in December 2011, we had we arranged uh, 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 with the guys that are running the Orkinus cluster, we arranged for a reservation of 2056 cores for 10 days. Uh, and that was a good fraction of our available time but there's no other way to do these things. Uh, and so the simulation uh, covers 1.23 million time steps on a 768 cube grid. And to give you an example here, uh, so we compute on 2056 cores 13 minutes for one minute start time. And one minute start time has to be divided in 1,366 time steps. Okay? But hey! Uh, this sounds like a lot of computing, but we're very close. Uh, we can almost compute uh, within a factor of 10 as fast as the star actually does it. And, you know, I think a factor of 10 within the next couple of years is clearly within reach. It's already in reach. If we really wanted to, we could calculate at the, uh, at the rate that the star is doing it. Okay? So what I'm going to show you is a, a late phase of this entrainment process. And what you're going to see is the protons, the yellow stuff here, the yellow arrows, uh, the hydrogen-rich stuff coming in. And uh, shown is the fractional volume or the mass fraction of this proton-rich material, the yellow stuff coming in. Um, and uh, uh, the color scale here is everything above 10 to the minus 3 is transparent so that we can look through this uh, hydrogen rich uh, stuff above. We look right at the top boundary here when we start the movie, and uh, the scale, color scale goes from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 8. Okay, let's, let's go. So, um, what you can see here is, first of all, that you can actually th see through the surface. And that just means that in most places, this interface is extremely thin. Already at this late time, at, seven, at 700 minutes, we're 
you know, a lot has been happening, uh, and this is clearly uh, in a steady state. The other thing that you can see here is that we have large-scale global gusts, which are really uh, covering the entire hemisphere. Here's a here's a situation where you have basically two upwellings collide, and then continuity equation. So they come up, they collide, and then continuity equation says you have to go somewhere. You can't go out because uh, you know you, 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 the ocean doesn't just spring up. Uh, you can't go out against buoyancy, so you have to go in. And these are these entrainment lanes that you can see here. Okay, uh, so there is really a large scale early on here, a, a large scale global um, structure to these entrainment uh, processes. And the other thing that you can nicely see here is that there is an exclusion zone in the middle. The convection zone actually does go all the way down here, uh, but there is this exclusion zone, and that is simply because the hydrogen that comes in is burnt, so it disappears from the visualization. Okay, so what we're doing here is actually, this is not a time evolution, but what you're seeing here is we're taking a, a frame uh, of visibility and we move, we rotate the star through that frame of visibility, which allows you like a very thin mask, basically, which allows you to see a little bit the really non-spherically symmetric, large-scale, inhomogeneous structure of this stuff. Okay? And uh, when you look at these movies, I think it is very clear that if you now imagine that wherever this stuff comes down, like here, it will release energy locally in that part of the 4 pi, right? It's very clear that uh, you cannot hope to simulate that properly in 1D. And uh, this is the goal of this research, uh, to identify um, the physics that goes into these kind of nuclear production scenarios. And uh, the importance of this is that we now increasingly believe that, in particular in the early universe, um, a lot of the elements have been made in these kind of convective, reactive, more extreme conditions. We have observational evidence that is pointing towards, that is mounting, theoretical from 1D. So this research is supposed to, in the long term, really uh, improve our capability to, uh, pre to have predictive simulations of this stuff. Um, here you can see the same uh, simulation actually. It has only a, a different uh, visualization on the left with different colors. And on the right you see the vorticity, which of course is an indication of turbulence, where you have a lot of vorticity, you have a lot of turbulence. Um, and you can see uh, that how this stuff, this is actually the entire convection zone. This is the bottom of the convection zone here. You see the inert core in the center. And you can sort of see this is, there, there is this exclusion in the middle. Um, the color scale, of course, was uh, chosen by me uh, last year attending our local uh, Halloween bonfire, uh, of which you can see images here, which is, of course, another combustion regime. Okay, um, and uh, well, uh, we need to go to a little bit higher resolution to see the same range of scales. But of course, uh, uh, it turns out that if you look actually at the dimensionless version of a fire like this or a thunderstorm, it is actually quite similar to this uh, uh, to these convection zones. If you write it down dimensionlessly, uh, it turns out that uh, this convection is almost identical to a thunderstorm or a bonfire, for that matter, okay? Um, but it, it leads to the question, to the important question, uh, how do we know, once we have done this simulation, that we really have the right answer? Because if you, if you can't prove that you have the right answer, well, who cares, right? We shouldn't care. We shouldn't pay any uh, attention at all. And so one of the things that we uh, do and we that we pay a lot of attention to is rigorous um, Convergence testing, uh, which is basically the question, do we get the same answer if we increase the resolution? Uh, are we solving the equations in the right way, the verification step? And I'll get to that in, mo in a moment. Um, 
But the other important aspect, of course, is the validation, which is uh, the question, are we solving the right equations? Um, do we include all the physics that we need? And the only way to answer that question is by going to compare with real data. Okay, so uh, we have to do that. And astrophysics and astronomy provides us with uh, some marvelous uh, constraints on this particular scenario. There's a particular type of stars. Um, I don't want to go through the details. Um, I want to only maybe show you here that uh, for a particular star uh, that belongs into this class, we have observations up here that say that certain of certain types of these heavy elements, strontium, yttrium, zirconium, are increased by a factor of 100. And our 1D models are these rot, uh, red stars here. You can see that they're obviously not working, uh, uh, matching up. Uh, we have studied this in quite some detail. And what we found is that the 1D is wrong in that it provides, uh, it predicts, it assumes that this feedback of the energy generation is prompt. It's immediate, splitting up this convection zone in an upper and lower layer, and thereby prohibiting the uh, neutron capture uh, reactions. And uh, we have done tests with nuclear synthesis calculations using this code that I mentioned before, again, doing calculations on Nestor and other codes. So this is the multi-physics part. Um, where uh, we have assumed that this split of the convection zone, which is the result of the feedback of the energy from this entrained material into the flow, would happen, it would have to happen at some point, but delayed. And we can put a time there. From that analysis, we say it should happen after 900 minutes instead of immediate. Why not go on forever? Because here are some elements that are heavier, that are not enhanced. And if you let this go, if you don't create a split, if you don't have the hydro uh, feel the effect of the energy that is generated from these entrained protons, you will eventually produce these heavy elements, barium and lanthanum, which are further up in the chart of isotopes. Okay, so what this says is you need to keep this communication between the upper layer and lower layer for a while, but not forever. Okay? It was this knowledge we went back and, and thought, gee, okay, our initial simulation didn't do that. What did we do wrong? And what we did is we did some scalings uh, motivated by the principle of dynamic similarity, which says that if you do it right, you can scale things to make your problem a little bit easier. Uh, we, we lowered the gra uh, gravity at the bottom of this core, um, and so that increases your current limit, so you need to do less time steps. And, uh, and But then you need to scale the energy generation. And so very quickly you realize that you don't know what you're doing anymore. So we went back to the drawing board and set up exactly this problem, ignoring the cost. Okay, And really did exactly everything as it should be in this particular case. And then we ran this again in April. Uh, again on Orcanus uh, from 11 to 22nd uh, of April. And so here you see now just a time evolution, uh, and you can see how the stuff is going in. The rate of visualization is a little bit higher, and you can see the same as before, um, except that after 300, 400 minutes, which is about now, you see that the amount of stuff that is coming in, there's a thickening of the outer layers, and then at 580 minutes, you see a transition into a clearly a split configuration where now suddenly you can clearly see here uh, the, the, the flame, the burning layer, very thin. Um, and that's sort of uh, exactly the kind of delayed split that we had been demanding uh, uh, from our nuclear synthesis simulations. Okay. So um, I cannot overestimate how, um, how much a success that was for us um, because you do these multi-physics simulations and lots of things happen there, right? And you can really screw up. But in this particular case, we were able to make this direct connection to these very strong astrophysical observations that we cannot explain in any other way. So um, we, we did this first round of simulations. We thought we could cheat. We thought we could scale it. 
Uh, but then we did the nucleosynthesis and realized, no, that's not going to work. Uh, the stars predict something else, go back, improve, and this is what we got. This was a run, uh, 1.47 million time steps, uh, again a 768 cube grid, 61 core years on Orcanus, again on 2056 cores. Um, because we had this run, and we had it sort of, you know, we had a good argument that now we needed to go and check whether the result would uh, would stand if we if we increase the uh, resolution. And because we had this ready in our drawer, uh, when a, when an opportunity came up for our collaborators to do early access Blue Waters uh, uh, run, uh, we could hand this setup to them. And uh, they increased the spatial resolution by a factor 1.5, which of course means that the cost goes up by 1.4 to the fourth power. Um, and so that was then a run that was done uh, to the tune of 13 million CPU hours, and it came out with the same result. Okay, uh, I should say that just this uh, earlier this week we uh, so okay so. So that's, that's I think, uh, for us, a, a tremendous uh, success uh, because we are um, really feeling that we have established for ourselves and for our uh, community that these runs now can be applied to other cases and we can really start uh, investigating this, believing that we, we get the right answer. Uh, Here's some scaling, so this code, because of the reasons that I told you about, uh, scales perfectly uh, to, to any number of cores that you can uh, provide. Uh, this is a strong scaling test going from 65 cores to 2064, and, uh, and uh, you know, perfect scaling should be a straight line, and you can see that in this particular case, we're, um, bec be because of certain details that you can ask me about, it's actually improving uh, the performance per node as you go down to a higher uh, cores. So we really need to run this on these large number of cores, otherwise it does not make any sense whatsoever. Um, okay, um, there's one more thing that I want to show you, which is uh, uh, I mentioned uh, the need to verify that we have the right answer. And one important way to do that is to really uh, run your simulations of this type for a range of resolutions uh, in space uh, with different grid sizes. Okay, and you can only trust that you get the right answer uh, if at some point uh, your answer does not change anymore if you further increase the resolution because it really means that uh, uh, you are resolving the, the range of scales that are responsible for the dynamical instabilities that do what you need to have done in that particular case. Um, so you, this, is, this was what I'm showing you here. I'm just showing you quickly the, the result was a precursor to what, we, what I just showed you. And this is why it took a while to get to this point. We investigated without the burn module whether we can uh, reproduce the entrainment rate and what is the resolution that we need to have the same, the, the numerically, quantitatively, the correct entrainment rate without any burn whatsoever. Of course, this is an important piece. So what you see here is from another run, set of runs, uh, some grid effects, and we could just, just discuss those, whether they make, whether they matter or not. But um, we compare here, for example, the maximum RMS velocity, and you can see a 512 cube run comes out really at significantly lower uh, velocities. But what we were focusing on is here are radially averaged entrainment or abundance profiles. And if you can't read the scale, it goes down to 10 to the minus 8 down here. And this is a time evolution. Uh, we can measure, we can integrate the amount of entrained material and plot it here as a function of time. And you can see that the 512 cube run really has not enough resolution. It shows a much larger entrainment rate, which would be just the derivative of this curve, of course, uh, than the high resolution cases. So if you then burned this stuff, you would, of course, in a 512 cube run, you would definitely get the wrong answer. 
because uh, you have just too much stuff that you bring in and everything doesn't work out anymore. But you can see from these lines down here, once we get to 1024, 768, 1024, it's really getting better. This is a little bit more an extreme setup than I showed you before. Uh, and so this is a, it's a slightly different setup. So the resolutions don't really match to, you know, qualitatively to what we saw before. But it's a, the, the concept here is that you can now go and measure the entrainment rate here. And again, there's various ways how you can do that. And we did that in various ways. Taking, you treat at this point the data block as if it were an experiment. Uh, you find uh, signatures in this numerical experiment. And there's, there's degeneracy in how you actually measure things. We took that into account, and that's these error bars. Uh, and as the grid goes up, 512, 768, uh, all the way here to um, 1024 and 1536 cubed, um, we fit this with either a power law that would signif signal no convergence and would just continue to go to zero, or with this offset exponential where the constant, the added constant, would be the converged entrainment rate. And uh, I think that this diagram really convincingly shows that uh, this converging uh, exponential is a better representation. And uh, with a certain confidence, we can actually say what for this particular simulation, numerically, with an uncertainty, the entrainment rate was. And so um, we, with this result under the belt, we can now go back and say, OK, by the way, 1024 is really sufficient for this particular setup. So now we go into production mode, and we don't need to spend the money for 1536. But within a certain uh, range here, we get the right answer for these lower resolution runs. OK? Uh, these are, for these type of environments, the first convergence, uh, successful convergence uh, uh, tests and demonstrations that I have seen. Um, OK, good. Uh, we do some of this stuff. We we mix. We do derive now mixing coefficients that we maybe can put back in 1D, and we don't need to talk about this. There's more sort of sophisticated analysis on these, other than the pretty movies. Um, but I think I should close here and uh, uh, have maybe a couple comments here briefly, uh, looking forward and uh, going away from my particular project here in our research program into more general comments about the, the role of computing. Um, and maybe this is something that we want to discuss uh, as well. So the, the main point here is what we're demonstrating that these predictive multiphysics simulations are really uh, a very powerful tool to investigate um, and generate scientific understanding and solve some urgent issues. I just mentioned to you that the same uh, code kernel that we're using in the star code is also used by uh, our collaborators to perform inertial confinement fusion simulations. Okay, Again, uh, as a matter of fact, the density and the, uh, 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 in, in an inertial confinement fusion environment are very, very similar. The temperatures, actually. It's just a different reaction rate. And so uh, the validation that we do here really helps these other applications. Um, but in general, I think uh, I really believe that the, the National Science Program uh, needs to take full advantage of this. Uh, we cannot afford to be blind on that eye. And in and, and, and this, what I still consider really an, an emerging area. Okay, I mean, we have been doing this for a while, but. These type of simulations and doing this computing is still an emerging area, considering what's ahead in terms of hardware and software. Um, so uh, I think the one, one goal that one could have is to, to really ask, do we, for example, have a credible path to petascale computing by 2020, um, ideally with homegrown codes? Uh, two out of the three codes that I showed you examples of were not homegrown. We have helped. We have, we have added modules, we have improved them, but the hydro codes are not homegrown. Um, uh, a challenge in terms of the hardware is that these future environments that will deliver these higher uh, rates of performance, they will come, but they will continue to be more hybrid. 
environments, and these are a moving target for code developers, but um, gee, that's just the future. We just have to deal with it, I think. Um, and so I think a point that I feel really strongly about that you know, has to go in parallel with the hardware development strategy uh, is a significantly uh, improve and develop some simulation code building exper uh, expertise. Uh, without that, I think it's very difficult to uh, follow along with everybody else uh, and make this uh, tool available to, to, um, to our environment. And so um, who is everybody else? Uh, I mean, you know all these things. You're the computing guys. But you know that internationally, uh, we have sort of a, a skip. Uh, every 10 years, we go in 2000, we had terascale uh, computing. Now, internationally, not in Canada, but internationally, now we have petascale computing. Um, and, uh, and people are really going towards uh, exascale computing by 2020. Uh, internationally, and um, you know we're we're in Canada. We're we are, I think we have been doing very well with Compute Canada uh, to to catch up and to be somewhere there. But um, we also have to admit we're not uh, in the leading pack with this kind of stuff. Um, and um, and so I I think there is sort of a mixed message here. I have been extremely successful with access at Westgrid, enabled, and our group has been doing terrific uh, stuff, and we can do so for quite some time. Uh, at the same time, I think the future um, aspects of this also need to sort of be carefully looked at. And that's all I had to say for now. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Falk. Okay, Malcolm, it's up to you. Any questions? Any questions from any sites? Raise your hand and unmute for your question, then mute again for the answer. So a question from Andrew. Go ahead. Okay, so Mr. Zucker, thanks, thanks for that very interesting talk. Um, I was interested in your, in, your, in your pretty movies, you called them, uh, for 3D visualizations. Um, I wonder how much you use those in, in your, your sort of workflow to discovery, because you have many different ways you're looking at the data, but the, three, the 3D visualizations in particular, uh, how, how do you use the 3D visualizations in your, in your path to, to discovery? They actually play a very important role uh, in the sense that um, <coughs> You know, you can you can um, extract uh, line plots like these, and they are useful too. But they, of course, they are aggregate and averaged quantities by definition. Um, but if you look, for example, of this in, at this set of four similar uh, of four shots, uh, this is sort of showing the very early evolution or. Um, of a simulation, starting here with the initial state. And then as the convection starts, this is a Cartesian grid. Of course, you start to see uh, grid imprints because we are uh, initially at a very, very tiny level of perturbation. And of course, you see grid imprints. But then you look further on, and as the real signal of the convection starts to approach this upper boundary, you can see that the grid imprints are overwhelmed by the real signal. And so finding bugs and finding artifacts um, uh, is, uh, is really uh, done to a large extent by looking at uh, these kind of visualizations. Um, uh, and so they play an important role. I have to say that, of course, we did not start with 3D uh, spherical uh, simulation. There were lots of tests done on just plain Rayleigh Taylor or uh, other things. Uh, and, and so for that, uh, the visualizations play a very, very important role for, for the investigation. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Kaori Tanaka from Saskatchewan. I'm just curious about the numbers you showed at the end. Uh, different numbers for different countries. Um, 
So how does Compute Canada or West Creek compare with Japan, USA, or Germany? Well, the numbers that I put here, and I just looked this up half an hour ago on the top 500, is uh, I looked, okay, so Germany maybe has a GDP which is, uh, well, it's not four times higher than Canada, but maybe two and a half. But they have four computers in the first 25. Uh, the U.S. has 10 computers in the first 27. Japan has five in the first 36. Australia has one at place 31. Norway, which is maybe, okay, it's a, not a good example, but Sweden maybe, which probably has a com an economy comparable to the Western states, uh, has already a computer at uh, place 76. Nationally, uh, Canada has two computers at 66 and 71, and these are the ones in Quebec and Toronto. These are 30,000 core type machines. Um, West Grid, I think, comes in with uh, letters, I think. And that's uh, somewhere uh, 100 plus. Um, so that's that's what the numbers are, and I think um, they're not bad. You know, they're good. We have good resources, um, but we need to work to stay at this level. Uh, but we could we could formulate the ambition to to be um, more in the leading pack. Which, which we're right now maybe not. But uh, I have to say from my practical experience that you know really the access and the kind of resources available to actual research are quite good. You know, we, we can clearly, as you can see, do what we need to do. Okay, thank you. I have a quick question here for, for you, Fox. So you used, you used the other international uh, you know, um, computational tool, I mean, uh, resources. So what's, I mean, do you have any comparison? Do you have any advice? Do you have any? Uh, the, the one thing that, you know, we, we could talk a little bit about is that um, I think, you know, I personally, our group has been faring very well, working very closely with the, um, with the, uh, uh, people who run the uh, run the clusters, um, uh, it, you know, we running these large scale simulations requires, uh, in an effective way, requires certain ways of setting the machine up, um, which are specific to uh, to large scale simulations. Um, if you have just more clusters around in a in, a, in an environment maybe like in the US where just you have just many more clusters, you, know, you will find clusters that are set up to only run large jobs. And of course they're configured a little bit differently. But other than that, um, uh, it is of course a question of scale. You know, it's difficult to compare. Uh, the Blue Waters machine that is now coming up in the US has 380,000 cores. And so even a 13 million CPU hour run, that you know, for for most of us would break the bank. Uh, there just slides in where's early access uh, as a test, and um, uh, that's a that's a reality. But at the same time, I think as you can see from from the results that I've shown, uh, m very meaningful and cutting edge multi. Uh, uh, scale uh, multi-physics simulations can be done with what we have, and we should do it. Okay, you thank know. you. Great. Time probably for one last question. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Okay, Dr. Herwig, thank you for your presentation this afternoon. We will thanks, thanks for listening in. Thank you. Pleasure.